Good morning, everyone. Good to have you here today. Uh, Napoleon had a favorite general, one of his favorite generals, who was attacking Austria. And one morning, this, this town, this Austrian town woke up, and all of a sudden, there were 18,000 French soldiers parked outside of it, demanding they surrender. And as you would imagine, they were absolutely scared to death. The ultimatum had been given. The church fathers said, we don't think we have any choice. We need to just give in. But the old Catholic priest goes, we can't give in on Easter. Today's Easter. We need to at least practice Easter and then leave things in God's hands. So they had their Easter service. And at the end of the service, they rang their bells. And it so surprised the French that the French assumed that reinforcements must have come to the village and the French took off. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. And I love that because it makes the case that the best defense for life is joy. You understand what I'm saying? And, and um, so, folks, we are starting a series today from James called um, Shattered, uh, Scattered and Shattered. And I can't wait to share some of the things that, that we're going to be talking about. So whether you're here or by, by Zoom, um, we want to start thinking about joy in some new ways. And to me, I'm a little bit always bothered that some of the best songs that we have, we only sing at Christmas time. So what I want to do is, just to prepare your hearts and, and get you in the right mood, uh, I want you to watch this little short video just to go with something familiar to tune up our hearts, okay? But you watch.
I know what you're thinking. You go, do we have to start singing Christmas carols this early? But you know what? Sometimes you just need to say, let's sing one of those, let's boom out one of those Christmas carols because it says it so well. Uh, remember last week, we talked about how God is this tremendously happy, joyful God. And we don't think of him that way, but Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10 says, All the people will go away to eat, to send portions of food, and to celebrate. And then this, this just great, great phrase, The joy of the Lord is our strength. And you go, oh my goodness. How that must have just set the world upside down that, that our God is a God of joy. But then Psalm 51, David comes back, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Or 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul writes, you became imitators of us and of the Lord for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And we talked last week, too, about how in John chapter 15 and 16, Jesus says, the joy that I've received from the Father, I'm going to turn around and give it to you. And what's interesting is that Nehemiah, and then in John, and then in, in 1 Thessalonians, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all involved, or concerned with joy, and they give it to us. That's our legacy. So with that, um, I'm going to ask you to... Go ahead, take the stand, take the stage, and will you stand up with me as I pray a prayer of invocation for us this morning? Father, we live in a world of such sour news, and you can't turn on the TV without being reminded of how fragile everything is. And I'm so moved by your word because you don't tell us to ignore the world or to act like things are better than they are, but you tell us to find joy in the midst of them because in the joy you are preparing us, you are shaping us, and that's where some of our, heart, some of our hope is today. So some of us have come in today, I know, with heavy hearts. There's been some, some hard news this week, and it seems in Congress that we're talking about joy today but uh, that doesn't catch you off guard. And I pray that you would weave together our worship and the words from Scripture and that you would minister to us and heal us that we might turn around and bless you as well. And God's people together said, Amen. All right, let's, let's stay standing as we um, lift our voices to the Lord this morning. Welcome. Just a second. All right. Did you feel the mountains tremble? Did you hear the oceans roar? When the people dares to sing of Jesus Christ, the risen Did you feel the people tremble? Did you hear the singers roar? When the lost began to sing of Jesus Christ, the saving one. We can see that God you in a mighty river through the nation. Young and old will turn to Jesus. Clean wide you heavenly gates. Prepare the way of the risen Lord. Open up the doors and
Jesus begins upon injustice. Join in one song. Now the streams flow as one river. Wash away our brokenness. We can see that God is moving. The time of Jubilee is coming. And young and old will turn to Jesus. Meanwhile, you have a need. Scripture that um, when God's people were called to go into battle, they sent the worship team out. <laughs> yeah, it's not the military. <laughs> it's the worship team goes out. And they go around and they go around and they praise God. And it just doesn't make sense, right? But in God's economy, like he knows where our power is. It's our hope in God. And so I don't know where you guys are at, but as Pastor Phil said this week, I've just heard some horrible news from some of the situations that my friends have walked through. And, and I don't know sometimes how to have joy for them, but I, we chose these songs because we are all worshipers and we go forth in um, remembering who God is, remembering his power, remembering that none of this actually makes sense in this world, but there is a spiritual battle. And so let's go forth together, you all worship team here. <laughs> go forth and um, remember who God is, that he is worthy. So let's sing this next song and may that give you strength to carry, <clears throat> carry you on and carry others um, towards the hope of Christ. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? all creation groaning it is is a new creation coming it is is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst it is is it good that we remind ourselves of this
truly love us he does. does the spirit move among us he does. and does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those he loves he does. does our God intend to dwell again to worship when we don't feel worthy though and um but that's when we put our faith in his choosing of, of bringing us into the kingdom it's not based on our works and sometimes i don't feel it i wasn't even sure a week ago if i can do this today but when we were practicing i remember thinking you know lord just give me what i need give me what you deserve so that I could give me what I need to praise you in a right way. And the first chord I played, like God just gave me the joy and gave me, he just connected all those emotional dots. So I hope that um, this time would be that way for you. And let's worship the Lord with this next song called Here As In Heaven. And I know we live in this earth and, and we're not in heaven, but we know we have the promise of eternity. And that's why it's a struggle because we know the Lord, we know we have his eternal life, but we still live here. And there's this in-between world where there's a lot of suffering. And, and that's why it's hard. But the Lord will, um, his Holy Spirit will uh, help us to really dwell in his presence on this earth. Here is in heaven.
Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat. I just have a few announcements for you. Um, 
I wanted to give you guys a couple of updates. Um, one, last week we prayed for Jim Howard returning to Russia, and you'll be happy to know he made it safely. In fact, he was like, you know you've been gone long when you have to take down your Christmas decorations in the middle of September. <laughs> so he was taking down his Christmas decorations and getting settled, so thank you for all the prayers for that. And then also, um, Pastor Phil is going to allude to this more in his sermon, but the seed fundraiser has been canceled for today, rescheduled. So um, we'll keep you posted as to the new details that come with that. So if you were planning on going, but today, tonight didn't work, lucky you. You will have an opportunity to go a little bit later. So we'll, we'll keep you posted on that if we know more of those details. And then also, um, I wanted to let you know that things are still progressing with the Harvest Festival. Thank you so much. And we decided it would be easiest because there's all these little pieces that need to work into place. Um, we're going to have a short meeting after church next week. So we would encourage all of you guys to come. Um, we are encouraging, obviously, all of you guys to participate. It's going to take a village to make this thing happen. So if you can plan to just stay, we'll provide some lunch for you. And if you could just stay for a short meeting afterwards so we can not only hash out a little bit more details, but maybe you guys can also have some input as to thoughts that you have and ways that you would like to be able to participate. So just plan to stay after church for that next Sunday. And with that, the children are excused. Thanks, guys. So let's go ahead and show that first uh, slide there. Yeah, so this is the, the title of our new series that we're starting today. But I have a question that I want to ask you first. Um, during COVID, have your viewing habits of what you watch on TV changed? I mean, three years ago, would, it, would you ever have imagined that I would watch a show called The Great British Bake Off? I mean, seriously, I'm, I say, could you give me another piece of the Battenberg cake? I mean, I wouldn't have done that. And now all of a sudden I'm, oh, I think the crust got a little bit burnt. I'm going, oh my goodness. But that's not the only show from England that I've liked. There's another charmer that I've fallen for called The Repair Shop. And it's set in a thatched barn. And inside of it are all these artisans who know how to fix what nobody else can fix. You know, pieces of precious old furniture, clocks, metalwork. But the one that I like the best, it's the ceramicist. It's the lady who knows how to fix pieces of pottery or, well, somebody brings in a shoebox full of, like, a statue that used to sit on your Aunt Dorothy's piano. You know, the one that you bumped with your elbow and broke? They bring it in like this, and she takes it, and she creates something of beauty and wholeness out of all of those shattered and scattered bits. And I go, what an ability she has. But you know what? There are people who have some of those same abilities all around us. I, I think of uh, guys in body shops who take these cars that have just been mangled and rear view mirrors that have fallen off and they create a car that looks almost brand new again. I, I like that. Or uh, a chef who can take things, you know, it's the end of the month and they haven't had time to go shopping and they take whatever is in their refrigerator, you know, the, the olives and the peanut butter and the pickle relish and they create this amazing meal. And I'm going, that is such an ability to be able to take the un unthinkable and, I don't know, create something of, of great worth for that, from that. And, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I wish we had more people who could do that. And, and I think this is where James comes in because he is an example of somebody who has taken all of these scattered and shattered people and he's creating something of, of beauty again. And with that as kind of my, my introduction, I want you to find the book of James in your Bibles. If, 
If you don't have a Bible, pull out your phone. If you have a phone app or we've got Bibles back here, I promise you not one person will notice if you get up and walk over and get a Bible. Thank you. Thank you. And if you need to look in your table of contents for it, great. That's, that's fine by me. And one other thing I would say is be comfortable. Um, if it is your Bible, go ahead and write in the margins. I think God can handle that because what we're doing is we're, we're remembering some of that for later on. But what I want to do is... Uh, explain the backdrop of James in a way that, that you get it. And I want to do it with the help of another story first. Okay? I like stories. Uh, Charlie Marsh pried open a letter from his best girl. Uh, her name was Frances Dyke. And she was 21 years old and she was a school teacher in Horton, Michigan. And Charlie was far away during World War I. He was in France. And the letter was short for this day. It was right after the, the New Year's. She said, I had so little to do today that I attempted to learn to play the Star Spangled Banner. I almost murdered it. But I am improving, even though it's still a killing affair. Then she goes on to say, we could not decide whether we wished to have school New Year's Day or have the day off and make it up some other Saturday. Hmm, that's curious. We finally made up our minds to have school, and we didn't try to keep it silent that they wouldn't be counted absent because it was a legal holiday. So we didn't have much school. We just put in our time. Just seems like a, a nice letter from a girlfriend to her fiancé, right? But how does your thinking change about that short little letter if I tell you that she was writing that in the middle of the Spanish flu epidemic? And she's been a teacher without students for months. They've been in lockdown. And the reason that they weren't able to have school, the reason they had school on New Year's Day was because they're trying to get in all of the days that the students need. And all of a sudden, you hear that story, and it makes that little bit of her letter all the more important. James is that way. There's something going on behind the scenes that makes the whole thing far richer. For example, I'll go to my friend here. This book was written, we think, 43 A.D., that means it's probably the first letter written in the New Testament. So there's no Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, no book of Romans, no book of Revelation. This is the first one. And it, even that by itself is pretty courageous. And there's no soaring theology like the Apostle Paul's writing. You know, no large amount of teaching actually it feels like very bare knuckle sort of, here's how you're going to need to put into practice what my brother, because James is the half-brother of Jesus, here's how you're going to need to bring to life, put into practice what my brother taught. Well, what else is going on? In the year 43, there was an, uh, an incendiary uh, persecution of believers and almost overnight so many people Jewish believers in Jerusalem who had to try to give away or sell off their property to and, and animals to to kindly friends and leave under the cloak of darkness imagine that so many Christian brothers and sisters find themselves as refugees. And so when you hear refugees, think of those pictures of people walking along the roads as they're leaving the town that they've known for years and years and years, and they're pushing wheelbarrows and maybe have suitcases that they're balancing on their heads. Their eyes are hollow, they're desperate, they're hungry. He's writing to people who've gone through that. And they find themselves in teeming cities like Beit Shan, Damascus, Antioch, 
Cairo, where now all of a sudden they find themselves competing for work in order to feed their families, try to put together some sort of a new life for themselves. Now, when we think of refugees, we have this, often we do, we have this romantic sense that, oh, you know, they're all thrown together and, and all of these refugees are helping each other and they're kind to each other and, and they're, they're all going to work together to fix their situations, if only that were true. I think we, look, we think of refugees that way because it makes, us, makes it easier to consider what it is that they're going through. But when you're hungry for, for food and you're fighting over cabbages and water and jobs, all of a sudden, the elbows come out. And the tongues get sharp as you talk to each other and how you treat each other. And you sense a competition and an a infighting that is profound. That's what's going on. Because as our Christian brothers and sisters got to new cities, they probably expected that we were all going to relate together and be friends together and care for each other and be sort of a social safety net. That's not what happened. It got hard. And it got vicious. And the wealthier believers wanted to only hang out with other wealthy believers because they felt like, all of the poor ones were weighting them down, and the wealthy were worried that their own stocks of, of, of shekels were dwindling. And all that they knew in Jerusalem, of everybody having everything in common and sharing, that went out the window. And people have written back to James. Why James? Well, all the other disciples, well, all of the disciples spread out to other places. And James is the guy left in Jerusalem. He's like the last standing spiritual father that they had. James, help us. We are broken. We are sad. We are, we're devastated. And what James is setting out to do here is that idea of the ceramicist. How can I take all of these scattered, shattered bits of people and begin to form them again into the lovely body of Christ that, that Christ intended for them? So now are you beginning to get the backstory? And, and are you beginning to understand the devastation that all of these people are, are, are dealing with? I do have to let you know... Uh, James, as a book, it even feels a little bit scattered and shattered. Uh, scholars get real nervous with, with James because scholars like to have everything neat and orderly and have like one big idea, one clear purpose for the book, and everything fits underneath of that. James doesn't fit that way. It feels, it feels like that ceramicist who works on the foot a little bit and glues on some new toes and let, then lets the glue dry and moves over and starts working on a hand. And then once they're done filling that in, they come back to the toes again. James is like that because he's, it's going to be coming back again and again and again to, to repeating themes. But with all of that said, I want you to join me. James 1, verse 1. And it starts simply. James a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you've been around churches very long, this already feels a little bit familiar. But if you sit with it, you notice some things that make it stand out. The first is, look at the last three words. Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that isn't Jesus' last name. <laughs> That's not his formal title. What's going on here is that the word for Lord uh, in the Old Testament, well, let me explain it this way. God gave his special name to, to Abraham, Yahweh. But remember that the Jews were also told, don't you dare take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And so the Jews are going, wow, we don't want to even get close to saying Yahweh out loud because it, it may be a little bit dangerous. And so they came up with another word, Adonai to describe God. 
So again and again and again through the Old Testament, the word Adonai is used. It gets translated into Greek as kurios or Lord. So when James uses Lord for Jesus here, what he's doing is he is elevating Jesus up to equivalence with the Father. And then when he attaches the word at the end, um, Christ, that was the word for Messiah. So he's saying, Lord Jesus Christ. And both Father and Son are involved in what I'm going to be sharing with you. And there's something that's missing here, I think, too. That Remember I said that James is the half-brother of Jesus? And I think if I were writing this, I would want to add street cred to what I was writing and include a little bit of a detail. Oh, yeah, this is what my half-brother told me to say, too. But I think it's so spare. This is James saying, I'm deadly serious on this. You're going to need to pay attention to what I want to. I, I, you need to pay attention to what I'm saying. It's that important for you. And there's one more reason I'm saying this, is that it's gruff the way he starts this, to the 12 tribes. No words of kindness, no words of warmth. What is that about? Because everything else we know about James is that he is this nice, kind, uh, gentle fellow. Everybody, even his enemies, saw him as that way. And you go, well, why isn't that there at the start of this letter? I think there's a good reason. Because he feels the seriousness of what he's going to share with them. He's laying down the law. And I think that what he is doing as he starts here is remember our statue that, that gets pieced back together. He's going, we've got to get the base solid again. And here's how he does it. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. Now, the reason that I, that I spent so much time last week talking about joy, and you all remember that I talked about joy last week, right? At least shake your heads, okay, right? I talked about joy. Uh, because I knew we were going to be talking about joy today. And James leads off talking about joy. And this is where I think even very, very quickly we get lost because as Americans, we tend to think that happiness and joy are the same thing. We misunderstand what he's saying here. And so there are a lot of times when people read this, they go, what? I need to consider what's gone wrong in my life as something I need to be happy about. It doesn't feel good. What, I'm supposed to paste a happy face on what has gutted me, the loss of my home, my community, the, the wheezing of my sick baby in the other room? And that not, isn't really what he is saying at all. Now, earlier, Lena alluded to tough parts of the previous week. Yeah, um, Friday night, the pastor of the church that I started, I was at the church for, for 19 years. The fellow who followed me after an interim, uh, he died uh, from COVID. Uh, was just 52 years old, a healthy guy. And now that congregation what hasn't been prepared for it, they are coping with the reality of our shepherd is gone. And that really is why the seed banquet had to be postponed. Angel was with us uh, uh, a couple of months ago, Angel Warrior, and she leads seed. And I think Angel understood some of what was coming and said it wouldn't just wouldn't feel right to try to have a banquet with all of this happening to our church family and to the family of, to our pastor and the family of our pastor. And so you come to uh, something like this 
And I think we hunger to read with different sorts of eyes and we begin to understand that happy is not a good translation of the word of what James has in mind here, okay? I want you to go back to that equation for joy that I gave you last time. And I've been thinking about joy and, and reading about joy for 10 or 12 years. And I think this is the best definition or best understanding of what joy is that, that I know. It consists of three component parts. The first is happiness or delight. And remember I said then that I said last week that happiness and joy are not the same thing, but they are related. It's like happiness is the raw material that is going to become joy. But in my definition here, we begin with happiness. But to happiness, you add heat, and that means struggle, challenge, difficulty. And the third part of the equation in this mix is gratitude. All three of those are what go together to make up Christian joy. James isn't saying find happiness in the event itself. Nope. You need to find joy beyond it. Don't ignore the ache that is roiling you. Grieve often, grieve well. But don't grieve as people who have no hope. Choose to land on a gratitude that what you're going through is not going to be wasted. As we're watching increased skepticism in our, in our own time, we're seeing people walk away from, from faith, walk away from God. And all that they're left with, if there is no God, is that there is no purpose in anything. James takes that and spins it completely over and says, here is the promise that you have. What you're going through, I promise you, will not be wasted. You can have gratitude that, that God will persevere through what has broken your heart. And he will not waste it. But he doesn't stop just there. He continues on when he had said, the testing of your faith develops perseverance and perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. There are really two different outcomes that he says are going to be the result if you choose joy rather than bitterness, rancorness, uh, rancor, or animosity. The first is it is going to build a new endurance. And think of this like athletes, because the word for endurance is an athletic word from their world. Think of it like a person who goes up and trains as they run or rides their bike in the mountains at high altitude. What happens? It enlarges their capacity, their lung capacity of, of the amount of oxygen that they can take in, and they adapt. When we choose joy, it changes us. It enlarges our capacity so that we are able to operate longer at, at a greater level of performance. And that is connected to then the second things that he says. As we develop this capacity, this tenacity, that's our part of it. God comes along, and he is the great ceramicist. And he begins to rebuild something of beauty. Choose joy, not because it's necessarily convenient, but that as God is getting ready to do something new, as you do your part, he is building endurance in you, and he will be the potter who reshapes, who does things that you hadn't intended before. Make sense so far? Now, let me tweak things one little bit. In English, English sets us up for problems all along. We use 
one, we, we use a word, the word you, as kind of like a, a, a do-all word. So I might say, uh, Rob, can you get me um, a, a cup of coffee? And when I'm using the word you there, it's to Rob just by himself. But if I, on the other hand, say, all of you need to sign up to help out for the, for the harvest fair, how was that, by the way? Was that, was that okay? Then all of a sudden, you changes, and it becomes all of you together. Other languages, <laughs> what'd you say? You yeah, this is you all. That's the word that he is using here. It isn't you as individuals, but we read it as us as individuals. That's not how James gives it. It's you all. You all together. Now, let's let that, that idea pop off some lights in your head where you're going, oh my goodness. Left to ourselves, we all read it as though this is what God's going to do in me. But what's really going on, he is speaking to an entire congregation. So now, let's go back. Let me read this again with this right understanding of the word you. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you all together face trials of many kinds, because you all know that the testing of your faith together develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you all may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. Are you picking up how that tweaks the passage a little bit? And you're going, oh my goodness. He's talking to an entire group of people here saying, together, count all that you're going through, these challenges not as something individual just between you and God, but together gather and consider these challenges with a heart of joy. Because as you do that, God is going to expand the capacity of your tenacity to, to walk with God, and that's when God steps in and begins to do new things as he puts pieces back together and he makes the statue beautiful again. And I have to say, this is kind of a different understanding of how most of us have come to think about what church is. Church has become something that you go to on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock, right? And you go and you sing and you hear a message and you turn around and go home and church becomes an experience rather than a sense of what God wants to do in our lives together with people that are my brothers and sisters in Christ. I think our affluence and mobility and love for autonomy has turned church into something that we go to rather than what we are. And I think that what COVID is doing is it is forcing us to go back to really what the New Testament talks about what the church is. And the church has gotten battered by COVID. Not just, not just us, but all, all over the world, pastors are going, wow, what's the future going to look like? Am I going to have a congregation? Am I going to get the congregation back? And before COVID, we as a church family went through some challenges. And I love this because it says, don't let previous circumstances determine your future. Let's take everything that we are facing together right now, count these things as joy because God is not done with us. God has a beautiful future of what he is doing in and through this church. And it's us together. So if you leave with nothing else, it, I want you to remember this line. God is creating a new beauty in us. And you know what? I want you to say that with me. 
God is creating a new beauty in us. Okay, all three of us did a good job on that. Let's do it again. God is creating a new beauty in us. One more time. God is creating a new beauty in us. And I am an outsider, and I'm looking on, and I'm seeing who this congregation is and who you are, and I'm picking on the spiritual desires of your heart, and I fully concur with that. And I don't want you to lose hope in the middle of the journey, just like James didn't want people to lose hope because God is at work. God is going to bring you, I believe, the, the right pastor. And there are people who are waiting for us to get this right all around us. I believe that's going to happen. We're going to try, not try, we're going to do a harvest fair. And one part of me goes, really? Do we have enough people? And, and, and that's the wrong way of looking at it. This is a dynamic opportunity for us to begin to practice our outreach muscles and to go, okay, God's getting us ready. We're thinking in some new ways. And in one sense, I'm not even thinking about even short-term results. I believe that this church is a strategic part of what God wants to do in all of West Sac. And you are part of that. And God is moving us and shaping us and putting us back together. We scattered and shattered bits. And it's going to be gorgeous. I believe it. So, will you lead us from here in song? As they do, will you pray with me? Father, James was writing to people in situations, in communities, much, much, much worse than this. And what he said is still true. That when we consider the challenges, the trials, with eyes of joy, you take that and you enlarge our capacity for you and capacity to be like Jesus. And you begin to mold and shape and... and and prepare us to become something of, of even greater wholeness and beauty. That's what we're praying for. Father, as we continue on in our worship, um, take the words of these, song, these, song, these songs and connect them to the thoughts and the feelings of our hearts that we might worship you well in Jesus' name. Amen. I searched the world But it couldn't fill me A man's empty praise The treasures that fade Are never enough But you came along And put me back together Every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, but you've seen them all, and you still call me friend, cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place where mercy and grace won't 
find me again Oh, there's nothing better than you There's nothing better than you Lord, there's nothing Nothing is better than you Oh, there's nothing shame into glory you're the only one who can you turn morning to dancing you give beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory you're the
sometimes we just need Christmas in September. So, Emmanuel means God is with us. Yeah. All right, let's close with a happy song. Death is beaten, you have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. An empty cross, the empty grave. Life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. He's alive. great to be with you this morning. Um, boy, that's, that's our hope. That's our confidence. That's, that's, that's enough said. <laughs> um, but we still live in the in-between until faith becomes sight. For the pastor of Sun Grove Community Church, his faith has become sight. But we want to pray for that church family, don't we? because they're stuck in the middle of that. And I want to pray for you because joy may feel like something outside your, your grasp right now. So join me in one last prayer, and I'll connect it in with a benediction. But Father, we want to pray for that lovely church family in Oak Grove. They are 
feeling bereft now and shocked and uncertain and um, they are living in the not yet. And so as their brothers and sisters in Christ, we pray for them. We pray for that pastor's family, for the leaders of that church who now are figuring out, okay, how do we lead in the midst of loss? And the words of James become even more um, guiding. And Father, I pray for those of us who um, we're living the challenge of, of reaching for your joy. But I would pray for each one of us that you would enlarge our capacity, the, compas the capacity of our souls for you and for endurance so that we can be part of new wonderful things you want to do through our lives and through us together. So, Father, as we leave here today, may it be with confident hearts knowing that you are the God who keeps his promises. You are the God who we look past our pain and can cling to. May we walk with you today and through this week with certainty, with hope, and with gratitude. And it's in the name of Jesus that we say together, amen and amen. Have a great week.